Panic, everyone. Okay. Um, so, hello, everyone. My name is, is uh, Łukasz Panek, and today we are going to learn how almost everything in our systems depends on contexts. So I guess that the first natural question here is that, what does this word context actually mean? And we will find out based on two simple examples, and I'm gonna illustrate them with this picture. So what can we see on this picture? Um, there is this 3D object in the center, and look, depending on the wall, it casts three completely different shadows, rectangle, triangle, and a circle. We may say that depending on a, on a perspective, uh, we can interpret, we can understand this object completely differently. Okay, so let's have a look at the first example. Row, what does this word mean? It depends. If we are right now working with an Excel spreadsheet, this word means a list of cells. However, if we are in a theater, this word means a list of seats. And if we are talking about boating sport discipline, this word means to row, means to move the oars in order to accelerate the boat. So in order to interpret the, the word in the middle, we needed to learn the circumstances first. We need to learn the big picture. We, need, we needed to learn the, the context. Okay, and the other example. Let's have a look at this sentence. I've been waiting for you for so long. What does it mean? Again, it depends. If these are the words said by Romeo to Juliet, they mean love. However, if these are words said by, by Darth Vader to Luke Skywalker, they mean threat. They are going to fight in a second. And if these are the words said by boss to an employee who is late, we all know what they mean to that employee. They mean problems. So again, uh, in order to understand the sentence in the middle, uh, we needed to know circumstances first. We needed to know the context. Sometimes we even say that uh, a sentence was taken out of context, out of its surroundings, and that's why it was misinterpreted. Um, okay, so these two examples showed us that a context, the word context means surroundings, circumstances, bigger picture. And if we have a word, if we have a sentence, if we have an event, a single event, we need to add context to learn what they are meaning, what's the, what's the, what's the true meaning of that, that uh, particular thing. Um, okay. And right now, your reaction can be like this, meaning, okay, Łukasz, nice philosophical intro. However, what all of this means to us developers? And I will explain it, this in the rest of the presentation, but let me first finally introduce myself. So, uh, I am a backend developer for 11 years, and I'm currently senior dev and team leader at Upfire, where I work for five years. Professionally, I'm a big fan of domain-driven design, of clean levels of abstraction. Some time, some time ago, I made a, an experiment of what can happen if you mess with these levels. If you're interested, here is the link. And I'm a big fan also of dependency inversion principle of, and inversion of to, uh, control techniques. And again, uh, this is my last year's presentation on that topic. And privately, I'm a big fan of space exploration, NASA SpaceX, uh, electric vehicles, you know, Tesla, etc., and uh, growth mindset and attitude, which I think is especially interesting for us developers, it can help us overcome quite a bit, uh, quite, an, uh, quite a lot difficulties in our profession. If you're interested, here is the link uh, to the presentation of the author, Caroline Dweck. Uh, okay, so regarding context, back to context, contextuality, contextual models, modularity, these are the topics that I'm interested for over half of my career, and this presentation is kind of uh, the essence of what I've learned throughout that time from workshops, presentation, books, and most importantly for my day-to-day -day work. And in order to uh, explain context to you, I've prepared some um, real-world examples, and, uh, and we are going to see uh, a first one, which is the longest, the biggest, and uh, yeah, and, uh, and I hopefully it will explain the, the, most, the most parts of, of, of context. So this example is from buses domain, specifically is from servicing city buses. And in this example, we will follow two different teams and we will see how different designs they, they produce depending on their knowledge and lack of that knowledge regarding contexts. So let's meet the teams first. The first team is called Team Unifiers and the second one is called Team Contexters. And what are their characteristics? Actually, they are, they are, they are identical. 
meaning uh, they have the same size, they have uh, the same roles, back and front end, QA, product owner, Scrum master, same seniority, they both work in Scrum, uh, they know clean code rules like functions should be small, etc. Uh, they know solid principles, they know that cohesion should be tight and coupling should be loose. They also know DDD building blocks like value objects. So for example, they know that ID of a bus should be represented as a dedicated type bus ID, not as primitive long, for example. They also know DDD aggregates, so they know that aggregates are there for, pro for protecting invariants, business rules regarding data consistency, and that, and that they, sh are, uh, they should be versioned. Also, other blocks from DDD, like services, repositories, factories, events, and uh, typical frameworks like Spring, Hibernate, Angular, etc. So what is the difference between the teams? The difference is uh, apparently small. Unifiers, then they don't know how to identify contexts, while contexters, they do. They know how to do that. And we will see what's, what will be the outcome from the two teams regarding that system. And let us um, learn the initial requirements for the system now. So imagine that we have a city called Fu, and the government of that city wants to promote public transport. And the government has bought new buses. Number of it doubled from 50 to 100. And the problem is that the public transport company has only four mechanics. And these guys, they just can't cope with servicing of such number of buses. And by servicing, we mean, you know, replacing oil engine, checking air conditioning, replacing used tires, all that typical stuff done on a regular basis. And the main concern for mechanics is that there is just too much calculation of next servicing window uh, for each bus. Like, if a bus rides each day, it means that, on average, some service actions should be done each week, but they don't, they don't need to be done too early. Like, we don't want to you know, replace oil too, too early because th this means unnecessary costs. We also don't want to do it um, too late because we, we have guarantee, et cetera, et cetera, the bus can break down. So it turned out that one mechanic started to work on this calculation full time. He does it in an Excel spreadsheet and it started to be, uh, to be uh, his full-time so full job. So the company wants to help the mechanics, and they want a small IT system that will calculate service windows automatically. So here is where our teams enter the stage. So let's have a look at the solution proposed by the first team, by Unifiers. They talked with mechanics, and they quickly identified that this world re resolves about around buses, around parts, about servicing rules for that parts and service windows and the actions. So they created an aggregate called bus with uh, methods for managing parts like add part, edit part, remove part. And just to have a better understanding, let's have a look at the structure of a part. It has an ID, name, it also has a set of service rules. And, a, and an example rule is o engine oil replacement rule which consists uh, of two triggers, like after mileage, after 10,000 kilometers, for, for, for example, or after a given period, you should, um, you should exchange the oil, and here is the set of acceptable oils. Okay, so this is this for, for the part management, and uh, other methods are for service windows, so a system can propose service window, mechanic can accept that proposal, then when the time comes, mechanic starts the window, while the window is open, mechanic does all the service actions, like replacing the oil, etc. When he's done, he finishes the window, and that's it. So again, let's have a look at the structure of a service window. It, of course, has its start uh, and end. It also has its status, proposal accepted, etc. And it has service actions, collections of actions that are done during that window. And each action has a reference to the rule, and some details, for example, what was the oil uh, eventually picked and what was the amount of oil pour, poured into the engine. And there is also one more thing. Um, this accept method, it protects invariant. And invariant, again, is a business rule for data integrity or consistency. And the rule is service windows of a given bus should not overlap with each other. Because does this um, does not make sense. Like, we have a windows like placed over on a timeline, and we don't want to uh, we don't want the system to allow the windows to overlap with each other for a given bus. So this is actually, this method makes this class an aggregate. Aggregate is a class that has at least one invariant that it protects. Okay, and some other methods, simple methods, setters, like set total mileage, set forecasted daily mileage, based on that forecasted value, system uh, calculates upcoming windows, and also some fields like ID, parts, service windows, um, total mileage, forecasted, plate number for um, 
presentation purposes. And version, uh, we want the aggregate to be versioned. We don't want um, problems with, um, with concurrent modification. So this version can uh, um, guarantee us that we will get optimistic, uh, optimistic lock exception if, if two mechanics or two other users will do the same thing with the same bus. Okay, and how is that bus used? The team created bus service with several, um, actually very simple, ver very uh, similar methods to the ones from aggregate. So add part, edit, remove, propose service windows, accept, start, finish, etc. And again, let's see how the propose service windows method look like, just to have a better understanding of the code. So at first we load the bus from the bus repository, then we invoke the, the command propose service windows, that command changes bus internal state, then we persist the change, this updates the version. This is where the uh, optimistic log exception can occur. And that's it. And uh, regarding proposed service windows method, this method calculates upcoming actions until given time. We have actions in return. These actions, nearby actions, are grouped into window proposals. So we have proposals, and then we just add these proposals to the internal collection of service windows. So that's it. That's the, um, that's the design proposed by unifiers. So what was the solution proposed by contexters? Actually, they proposed exactly the same design with the same service and the same aggregate with all these methods. But this decision triggered discussion within a team. And let's have a look at the main points of this discussion. So first of all, someone noticed parts are changed less often than service windows. And this was an example of rate of change analysis. Then another guy uh, observed that parts management may be it is a different business process than service windows management, and this was an example of business process analysis, a simplistic one. Um, another observation, most methods work on most fields, but not always, like there are some uh, plate number, etc. Some, some methods used only in setters, so this was cohesion analysis. However, other guy uh, um, added, these cl uh, this classes both aggregate and the service aren't that big yet, and most importantly, we are just at the beginning of the project. We don't know whether customer will want to develop that system or not, so uh, we don't want know whether the new requirements will eventually arrive, so it's okay, let's just accept this design and go further. So this was exactly the, the same design, and after a month or so, both teams were ready, the system was deployed, and actually it was a huge success, and this is the GIF sent by the mechanics uh, to the developers to express their gratitude. They were so happy they felt like a boss. Um, yeah, and so the system was so successful, soon the customer asked for more, so the new requirements arrived. And what, what were they? Um, mechanics wanted to know when each bus rides the bus line. Why? Because they didn't want to plan their windows while the bus is in the city riding with passengers. Um, there was also another, another person, person responsible for assigning buses to lines and to drivers called planner, and that person wanted to define right windows and their proposals just like mechanics did, and planner also wanted to know about service windows of mechanics. So generally, this invariant that we just saw, like it, it grew, because right now we need to protect windows from ser service windows from mechanics and also windows from planner that, that they also do not overlap with each other. We just cannot accept that, for example, mechanic want to work with a bus while it is riding in the city. So, so th that, is, that was the rule. And uh, planner also wanted to know some more parameters that impacted his or her assignment to lines. For example, distance travel per, per single refueling to better plan technical rides, duration of single refueling, of course it is longer for, uh, for electric buses, and is bus zero emission or, or electric, because according to government rules, only such buses could enter Old Town. Okay, so how these requirements were tackled by unifiers? First of all, they created another service called bus ride service with all the methods regarding ride windows propose, accept, start, finish, etc. Also with setters for the parameters required by, requested by, um, by planner. And regarding bus service, the service from the first iteration, it actually turned out that they just can rename the service and funny thing happened along the way because this service was actually meant for servicing. So its new name was bus service service. And, uh, and this is actually another great example of context, uh, contextual meaning, like the first word service means you know, servicing or maintaining, while the second one means application service. So uh, actually, in reality, I, I guess they, will, uh, they would just rename it to bus maintenance service or something, bec but because 
Um, maintenance is a longer word. It could not fit on my later slides, so please accept that awkward situation. Sometimes this just happens. Okay, so this is, this is it for, for the services. And what about the aggregate? This is the shape of the aggregate from the first iteration. And remember, the, the, new, the new requirements, the new invariant was, should cover also right windows. And it should be al always, this rule should be always met. So the team decided, okay, let's just add new methods to this class, voila. And, wow, this class is, is right now much bigger. And this triggered discussion within unifiers. And the first thing noted was, okay, this class is big, uh, much bigger mostly because of the right windows, but also due to new attributes. However, right windows have to be here, added someone, like, because there is this rule between them and the service windows. And there was also another argument, because we need to have all the things here inside one, one uh, bug, because we have to show all these windows, servicing and right windows, together in UI. And someone added, okay, maybe this is just our system that is different than others, all that beautiful rules, etc. maybe they just do not apply in our context. Um, okay, let's just take this design then. In the future, we will have more time, uh, more requirements, more data, it will be easier to decide. So this, this was the final, uh, final design proposed by unifiers. And what about contexters? Contexters also decided initially, okay, we'll, we will add all the methods to the bus aggregate, and it also sparked a discussion. However, this discussion went differently, and let's have a look. This class will be too big, it needs to be split. It was a hard declaration, we need to split it somehow. Look, planner is a completely new actor here. Previously, this class served only mechanics, and right now it would serve two actors. It would be, you know, a slave to two masters, someone would say. So this was business actors analysis, or single responsibility principle application, let's say. Um, another observation, these actors, very important observation, these actors use different languages regarding to buses. Mechanics talk about oil replacement, tire checks, etc., while planner talks about assigning clients and assigning drivers to, to buses. So this was language analysis. Third observation, these actors take part in completely different business processes, servicing and planning. And what is more, this is just unwise that, for example, finishing service action by mechanic can mm, conflict with assigning driver by planner. Like, th they will conflict. Why? Because we have one version, so if they are done these actions simultaneously, we can get optimistic lock exception. But from a, from a business perspective, it should be totally legal that at the same time mechanics uh, finishes action and the planner plans assignments. So this was business processes analysis. But again, there is this rule between the, win between the windows. They just cannot overlap with each other. We need to prevent this, uh, added someone. Okay, so we need to think harder. We just cannot give up. This cl class needs to be smaller. So what this team intuitively knew is that bus, as a real-world thing, as a complex real-world thing, should not be modeled with one model only, with, with model, you know, mirrored or uh, shaped to the, to the shape of the 3D object of, of the bus. They knew that with the planner requirements, a second context arrived. We, have, we had servicing and now we have riding. So within the servicing context, we talk about service windows, oil replacement parts, total mileage. And in a ride context, we have ride windows, line and technical rides, we have assignments of lines and drivers. So what the team knew, because they knew how to identify context, they knew that models in source code, they should not mirror real-world things like the bus in the center. The mo mo th these models, th the models that we create, they should mirror mental models that our business experts have about these things. So if a mechanic understands a bus as a rectangle, then our model should be shaped to that rectangle, should be tailored to the, to the um, representation of a bus that our expert has in its mind. And similarly, if a planner understands the bus as a triangle, we should model this class as a triangle. Um, yeah, so, but there's, there was that problem. There, there was this strict rule between, between the two, and that rule prevented the, 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 the team from cutting the class into two. Yeah, so they started um, brainstorming. Oh no, oh, there should be a picture there of brainstorming. I don't know why they didn't load, but they started brainstorming and they, and they uh, discussed, and this is the 
the, the most important uh, observation during that brainstorming session, maybe we should just extract that common part of adding, editing, and removing windows into some other place. Okay, and how we will name that, that, uh, that extracted part? It relates to bus availability management, something like making reservations, bookings. Bingo, that was this. The, the, they needed bus reservations model, a model, deeper model, that would combine the two, that will maybe not combine, that will help the two uh, contexts to cooperate with each other. They needed bus reservations model with very simple operations like add, edit, remove reservation and get reservations. So what was then the design uh, proposed after that discovery? The code from the first iteration was placed in a dedicated module called, called bus service module. We can think of that module as a Maven artifact, for example, if we use Maven. And they, the team placed their bus service service and the aggregate from the first iteration with all the methods, with all the fields. And then the team created another module called bus write module with bus write service and a completely uh, separated, completely independent aggregate, also called bus, with the methods for planner needs and the fields for planner needs. And this is very important. These classes, although they have the same name, they are completely different. And they also, they have these aggregates, they have completely separated database tables. Like the first table can be called service underscore bus, and the second one can be called write underscore bus. So these are completely different um, modules with completely different uh, data. And the both modules were linked with the um, common deeper model with the bus reservation module. Uh, and its main class was bus reservation service with add reservation method. We have bus ID, owner ID. It can be service module or write module. We have two owners uh, for now. And we have edit reservation, remove reservation, and get reservation. So, so that was this. Uh, this, is the, this is the design. And if I were you, um, here there should be um, another picture. Excuse me, do we have internet? Um, because there should be... Nice picture, I think, there. Uh, I, can, I can switch to my internet then, um, because it's quite important for me to, to have these pictures. They, will, they can explain a lot. Okay, I will try to switch to, um, to my internet. Mm, let me just check. Oh, yeah, there is the picture. Great. So if I were you, most probably I would, I would look like this puppy. I mean, uh, okay, this design is interesting, but I have some questions. I'm not yet sure whether I like this new design or not. So I tried to guess your questions, what may bother you right now, and I answered this uh, imaginary question. So the first possible question that you might have is, okay, how to use bus reservation service? And let's have a look at the bus service service and its method accept service window proposal because this is the the moment when a proposal turns into fully fledged uh, reservation into fully fledged window so first of all we invoke add reservation on the reservation service we pass the name of the module this is a simplistic way the name of the module as the owner we get reservation id in turn then we look for the bus in the repository, and then we, we invoke its command, accept service window proposal. And this is where the two contexts are combined, because in this method, we put into the aggregate from the service module, we put the reservation ID, because we want the aggregate to have the reference to the reservation in the common module. And then we persist the change. And two notes here. All above is done in one database transaction so that we guarantee consistency between the bus aggregate and the bus reservations aggregate. Bus reservations aggregate is inside the reservation service. We just cannot see uh, this aggregate here. And that decision may, uh, may trigger some of you because we modify two aggregates in one transaction. And this breaks the rule of thumb change only one aggregate in one transaction. And let's stop here for a moment. Why, we have, why do we have this rule in the first place? This rule prevents us from scalability problems. Uh, this rule uh, wants to uh, make us sure that we don't run in, in such, into such problems, meaning and scalability problems mean regularly changing a lot of data at once. And whether this is our case, like as we said, um, servicing window is done, is, is added once every week. Riding windows are done maybe seven times a week. If, uh, uh, if a bus rides seven days a week. So we have eight windows per bus. We have 100 buses, so we have 800 windows added or edited maybe a week. So this is not a huge volume. So 
since the, 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 these changes, these uh, changes regarding reservations are done <coughs> not so often, there is no risk of scalability problems. And another like lesson to be learned from, from this example is that rules of thumb exist just to make us think twice. They, are, they aren't dogmas, they aren't always true, they are actually contextual as well. In some scenarios, in some situations, in some contexts, they are applicable, in others not. The idea here is just to stop for a second and think whether we can safely uh, ignore a given rule. Okay, and the second question, what about showing data on UI, which was actually Team Unifier's main concern? Remember, this concern um, emerges from the fact that we have data spread into three, into three uh, different modules. And what if we want to show data on a screen for mechanics? Like we have a bus DTO that we will send uh, via REST, and we have ID, we have plate number, we have service windows. Mechanics want to see also the actions inside these windows, and we have write windows. Uh, since we are mechanics, we just want to know the, the start and end date. So what if we have such scenario? What, how we should prepare this DTO? Contexters decided they, that, will, that they will add another module called presentation module with a bus presentation service, and this service will construct this DTO with two queries. First queries will be run uh, on a reservation module. We will ask its database for all the reservations for given bus, both service windows and write windows. So this is how we get dates. And then the second query uh, for getting plate number and for getting all the actions uh, connected to the windows. And this may trigger two, um, two sub-questions in your head. First of all, okay, right now we have two queries to database, and this means performance drop. And my answer is, is this really a problem? Is this drop even noticeable? Most probably not, but if so, there are some solutions to, to this situation. Like, for example, we can cache bus DTOs. The ser presentation service can cache these DTOs and clear them on any event in the lower modules. Uh, and that's it. This is the, f the, the, the most, uh, the, the simplest solution. And another sub-question is, okay, and the data can change between the queries. For example, first query returns 10, um, 10 windows, 10, 10 reservations, and the second one returns only um, four service windows. What, what's, what then? And this is actually a good point, and the bus presentation service should be prepared for this. And uh, we have two solutions, um, like two, um, like, maybe the easiest solutions here are, okay, uh, so the service should detect inconsistencies between queries and it can just rerun them, or it can show a message asking user to refresh the page because data changed while loading screen. Maybe that, like, the, first, the first solution is better because we do not engage users. However, it's, it, it, this, is, this list is not um, um, complete. Okay, and regarding the third question, what about bus ID in both aggregates? Some of you may notice that both aggregates have this field ID and whether there is a relation between the fields. Yes, indeed, there is a relation. Each real-world bus should have exactly the same ID in both modules. Why? Because we want to use the same ID when we add a reservation in a common module. And how to ensure this, uh, this identical IDs? Uh, in bus presentation service, uh, contexters created new method create new bus and this method generates bus ID and then they pass this ID to create new bus to the service module and then to the write module and all of this is done again in one database transaction to ensure consistency between the data and again you may ask okay one more time two aggregates uh, modified in or created in this case in two, uh, in two contexts but let, let us ask ourselves how, how often do a company uh, ba uh, ba uh, does a company buy a new bus? It's even more rare than in the case of Windows. And the very last question, what about duplicated data, namely plate number field? Because again, my, some of you may notice that we have plate number in both aggregates, and this is data duplication. So first of all, let's notice that plate number does not participate in any business rule. This field is here only for presentation purposes. We want to show plate number on a screen for mechanics and and for planner, and contexters had two options here. They could duplicate this field in both bus classes, and this is actually what they did, or they could create another fourth or fifth dedicated bus model and move that field there. But they felt like having you know, another class for only one field is, a on, is an overkill, so they decided that, okay, option one is enough, and also like, the rate of change of plate number is very, is very rare. Like Plate numbers are, are changed very rarely, so as a result, the, the team created update plate number method in presentation service, and again, in one transaction, this method updates both aggregates, and that's it. 
Okay, so let's sum up uh, the pros and cons uh, of the multimodal um, approach. First, the cons, the disadvantages. When we create data, we have to ensure common ID in all contexts. When we update data, we, we have to ensure consistency of duplicated data, if such duplicates exist. When we remove data, sometimes we need to remove them from all contexts, but this is not a uh, general rule. And when we present data, we need to ensure performance and inconsistency tolerance, of course, if many queries are needed in the first place. And what about the uh, advantages? We get several small contextual models that are all tailored to the needs of given context. And as a result, our classes are smaller, with higher cohesion, with single responsibilities, and are easier to test. And the second advantage, system is easier to change. It easier absorbs new requirements. And some of you may ri right now ask, Wukash, are you right? Um, hola, hola. Let's first prove the second uh, advantage. And I will prove it with a third round of uh, requirements. I will just add that the second iteration also was successful. Contexters needed some more time, but they also managed to, to prepare the system within the deadline. And so the third iteration of requirements arrived. And what were they? A new customer arrived, government of a second city called Bar. They also wanted the system, but there was one thing. Bar City had buses and trams this time. Regarding the first city, mechanics from the first city from Fu wanted the system to track bus breakdowns as well, and planner from Fu wanted the system to recommend bus drivers to assign. So three new requirements, as you can see, things got hot. And in reaction to all above, our project manager decided that from now on, the system will be developed by one more team. And the manager wanted our team to decide what responsibilities to transfer to the new team. And what was the solution prepared by Team Unifiers? They, when they uh, reminded themselves of the size of their aggregate bus from the second iteration, their reaction was like this, or even more um, sensible members reacted like this. So let's uh, leave them for a second, let, let them recover, and let's see what, what was Contexter's reaction. And, rea and, and Contexter's reacted this way, meaning let the requirements come, we will tackle them. So what they did, um, first they draw the map of their modules, or context map, as, uh, as we may say from DDD. So we had service module, we had write module, and we had reservation module. And regarding the first requirement, support for, for trams, the team, de the team decided to create two more contexts, two more modules, a tram service module and a tram write module. And you may wa ask why. Why they do not put the, the tram-related code into the uh, already existing module and maybe rename bus to vehicle or something. They did uh, separated modules because they talked um, to mechanics and they learned that from a mechanic point of view, it's a completely different thing to, to service um, to service uh, trams, you need different skills, you, uh, you need different parts, the rules are completely different, like they are completely different things. And the second argument, even more important, is that remember only the customer from the second city wanted trams. If we put all the tram-related code into the, the old modules, that would mean that the par bar city, the customer would pay for something that it doesn't need. And also, we would need to um, maintain the code that is not needed there. Okay, and the only question that remained was what to do with team reservations. Like the natural, natural uh, thing was to add, uh, to, um, to add a link to the bus reservation module. However, this module was tailored to the needs of a bus. But was it indeed from the, the team thought twice, and actually they realized that from a bus reservation module perspective, it doesn't really matter whether you reserve time of a bus or a tram, so the team decided just to rename the module, to generify it, and that's it. And this is how the first uh, requirement was tackled. Let me just move the, the, this module, the common module, to, to the center. Regarding second requirement, support for bus breakdowns. Again, team decided to create a new breakdown module. You may ask why. Uh, because again, they, they, they uh, discussed it, uh, with, uh, with a customer and they learned that completely different business processes take part within that module. Like you may send a broken bus to a producer as a part of guarantee agreement, or you can communicate with bus insurer. So these are the processes that do not exist in the service module and that, that was the reason why the team moved breakdown support to a completely different module. And uh, the, the only thing that remained was the parts, because parts are used both while servicing and, and while breakdown. So the team moved parts to the bus part module, another new module, and ser only service rules 
uh, remained in the service module. And the very last uh, requirement was the support for recommendation, uh, for driver recommendation. The team just added service. And what about, uh, what about uh, handling availabilities, driver avail availabilities like vacations or sick leaves? Again, the team realized that the vehicle reservation module can be generified even more. From a, from a vehicle reservation module perspective, it doesn't really matter whether you reserve time of a bus or a tr of a tram or a, of a person. So they just renamed this module to resource re reservation module and they used that module to store all the sick leaves, all the va uh, vacations, etc. Yeah, and uh, by the way, like I think that this resource reservation module example is a really nice one because with these modules for bus, we have we have the approach when we like split real world object into smaller ones. We have real world object model in four contexts, and with this resource reservation module, we, we do the opposite. We have many real world objects: trams, buses, uh, people, drivers. We have all blended into one thing called resource. And, uh, and I think that this is nice to, like, to, to, to be aware of that, that context, they work in both directions. We can like, split real-world object into smaller things, into detailed things, or we can merge many real-world objects into one. It depends on the context. Okay, and the last requirement, the requirement from the project manager. Uh, what, uh, what, uh, what, was the, what were the responsibilities passed to the new team? Contexters passed the easier part to the new team because they wanted the team to first learn the, the domain and they left for themselves the, the harder part. And that's it. The contexters are done, so let us now return to team unifiers. Unifiers recovered quickly and they uh, identified that what they, what they are missing is, uh, is uh, some contextual knowledge, so they started to read books, to watch presentations, etc., etc., and finally they felt that, okay, we know Kung Fu, we know what was the missing part in our heads, the contextual awareness, so they decided that they just need to introduce context and modularity. And I will be honest with you, like <coughs> refactoring their code into, into modularity is a quite big part, and we do not have time today for this, so I just, uh, you can write down this link, and under that link you will find uh, slides where, where I explain what was the path um, that unifiers took to, uh, to indeed introduce modularity. And actually, this, this slide ends the, the biggest, the, the first example. And um, I have some more examples, but they are mini ones, three of them. And in the first mini example, I want to show you that not only big, complex things as buses are contextual, it turns out that also uh, small things, like a chair, can be contextual as well. And let's imagine, you are right now conference participants. What is important for you as a conference participant regarding your chair? If I were you, I would say distance from the skin. I would like to be sure I have, uh, uh, I have, I have glasses. I would, I would like to be sure that I can see the letters. And what about conference organizer? From a conference organizer perspective, chair dimensions are, uh, are important. Like conference organizer want to make sure that people can fit, all the people can fit within the room. And what about store worker, a guy who stores chairs between the events? What is important for a store worker? You may say, again, dimensions, but in reality, of, of course, these are dimensions, but dimensions of a chair stack, because this is how chair is stacked, is stored in a, in a store. So even such simple thing as a chair can be contextual, as we can see. Okay, another example, another mini example, the second one. Uh, in this second example, I want to show you that not only physical objects like buses, like chairs, I don't know, like buildings can be contextual, also abstract things can be contextual. And by abstract, I mean things that exist in the real world, but we cannot touch them or cannot see them. Like, you know, the law, uh, love, or company is, is abstract. Of course, we can touch or see uh, a worker, an employee, but still a company is something more than just employee or just a building. And another example is a football club. Football cl club also is, uh, is abstract. We can touch players or see the stadium. However, club is something more than, than the physical things that are part of the club. So what is important for a club owner? I believe I make a huge oversimplification here, but if I, was, uh, if I were a club owner, I would say that for me, it's all about money. I mean, I, uh, player costs are important, tournament prizes, sponsors income is important. And what about club coach? For, for a coach, 
player skills are important, trainings, opponent strengths and weaknesses, also tactics are important. And what about um, club fans? Uh, what club means to them? For a real club fan, club is everything. It's more than life. So we, we, just, uh, we can see that also abstract things can, can be contextual. And another example of abstract thing that can be contextual is a presentation for a conference, like this one. And in this example, I want to show you that we can cut things into contexts not only based on actors, but also based on, um, uh, because they can evolve over time. And again, um, what do you think? How this presentation looked like two months ago? Two months ago, we were in a call for papers phase. So actually, my job then was to submit a proposal. Organizers could assess that proposal. If they had some doubts, they could request for more data, like sub sample slides or more detailed abstract. And if they were finally glad with what they saw, they could accept my proposal. And then there was a presentation preparation phase. And during that phase, I needed to prepare this presentation. You could possibly click like button to give me or organizers a hint whether this will be a nice uh, topic, interesting topic. Organizers, among many other things, they could schedule a day and time of the presentation. And all of this uh, was running until the time was up. And right now we are here in the presenting phase, and in my job here is to click slides and to keep talking. Your is to listen, to watch, and maybe ask questions. And all of this again will happen until the time is up. And look at the highlighted points. These events are things, are events very important in the life cycle of a presentation. We call them pivotal events. And pivotal events are events that change given things substantially. It becomes something different, it transforms. Like these events change the rules of the game. Many current operations, like operations available in the first phase, they are completely replaced with the operations from the second, and then they are replaced with the, with the operations from the third. Like, this is very important, like, we, we should follow the, the verbs, the, the actions that are, um, that are uh, possible. And uh, uh, we, we can say, actually, that these events are, are so, you know, important that that uh, we, we dealt with completely different objects, with completely different things in these phases. Like in the first phase, we had presentation proposal. In the second, we have upcoming presentation. And now we are ongoing uh, presentation. And you may ask, OK, how can we spot pivotal events in our models? And this is actually very simple. Let, just have a look at your class. And when you see that your class has many statuses, maybe even with sub statuses, and, that you, and, and if you will see that your methods rely heavily on these statuses, meaning you have at the very beginning of a comment, if status is not as I expect, throw illegal state exception. This means that this method should not be here. It should be you know, placed in other phase. So what you can do, uh, first of all, you, you, can, you can then um, uh, uh, say that, OK, some statuses are, are, are most importantly, m most probably, result of pivotal events. So what you can do, you can just split your class on these statuses. And the same actually uh, could, could be done regarding service windows. Remember, we had proposal, service window proposal, in progress, etc. Actually, the team could create new uh, classes for that, uh, for that occasion. OK, and just to um, convince you that having multi-models multi for presentation is better than having one unified model, let us um, follow a new requirement that can arrive. Let's say that main sponsors, main conference sponsors, are given presentation slot automatically. They, can, they, they call for papers phase is not needed for them. In other words, sponsors go through shorter paths. So how would we tackle that requirement having multi-models? It's that simple. We could actually start with creating upcoming presentation with the second class. We can just skip the presentation proposal phase, and that's it. We're done. But if we are in a unified model, it could be trickier because maybe we, sh we, we, we will be forced to bypass some business logic in the big class. Maybe we should, maybe we'll be uh, forced to add some new ifs uh, to this class, or maybe we will be uh, forced to somehow fill not null columns in a database columns specific only to the proposal. So this is an example of an uh, of advantage that we, g that we get when we have uh, smaller classes. OK, and that was the final example. So let, let us see the summary. And if there is only one thing that you will end up remembering from my presentation, please let it be this slide. So um, for any real world object, for any real world thing, either physical or abstract, it may look differently in minds of our business experts. Depending on context, 
Mm, business expert may have completely different mental models of given thing, like rectangle, triangle, or a circle. And what that means is that our source code models should not mirror this thing in the center. Our source code models are created to help our users, to help our, uh, our uh, business experts. So, they, so our models should mirror mental models that they have. We should create separate models in this case, uh, just to help our users. And uh, this results in multiple contextual models in the code, and this is just the opposite approach to the big unified model boom. And uh, again, what are the pros of contextual models? They are small and precise. Again, each one of them is tailored to the needs of specific context. They are composable and extendable, so they can be rearranged to new requirements, possibly with only little work, like we can treat them as a building blocks. We can you know, play with them like with Lego. Uh, Lego blocks, like that was an example from the presentation uh, presentation example. They are replaceable, so it is easy to replace them. For example, we could replace um, the reservation mod module uh, for, from buses with a, uh, with a generally available library. Th there is no problem with that. And they are microserviceable, so if a model is well crafted, we can easily move it to its own microservice. And uh, cons, we already saw them, but again, to have all of this in one slide. Presenting data may be more cumbersome due to performance and consistency concerns. Um, updating the applicated data has to be done in a consistent way, most probably. And last but not least, please remember that contextual models are an investment. And this investment will return only when we have new requirements. And this is actually the, 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 the reason why contexters, during the first iteration, they accepted uh, having parts and having servicing, uh, service windows in one class. Because they didn't know whether customer will like the system, whether the customer will arrive with new requirements. So they didn't want to invest into cutting the code into, into making it more, uh, more uh, contextual. And the very last slide, the toolbox, what are the techniques for, for identifying context? The first technique is just listen to the language. And s why? Because we are, we can, we c as developers, we cannot uh, read uh, minds of our users. We cannot go there and see what is your mental model uh, in, in, your, in your head. The only way for us to learn that someone has rectangle in its head or triangle is just to listen to the language, listen to the sentences, listen to the verbs that this guy uses. And this is how we can spot that, okay, maybe you have different understanding on that particular thing. So uh, apart from listening to the, to the language, you can also um, uh, read or watch about ubiquitous language and bounded context from DDD. Another technique, visualize business processes and cards from event storming and great for, for that. Another technique, identify business actors and uh, analyze the rate of change of, of model parts, like parts of buses changed in a different rate uh, than service windows. So uh, again, uh, search for pivotal events. Remember uh, about the statuses. You can also see a very nice perspectives being, behaving, becoming. It also helps a lot. Analyze cohesion. And, an, uh, and the last uh, technique, uh, you can just ask your model, what business questions do you answer, my dear model? And, and if these questions, if there are too many of them, just split the model into, into several parts. And you may ask, okay, so many techniques, what techniques should I pick? The simple answer is, the more the better. Like, if you attack your situation, your, your model, your, your code, your requirements, with, from all that angles, you will get bigger picture, better perspective of, of, uh, of what is going on. And um, if you want to learn even more, uh, I can recommend uh, Better Software Design podcast by Mariusz Gil, and generally what Mariusz Gil, Kuba Pilimon, or uh, Łukasz Szydło, or obviously uh, Sławek Sobotka, what they do regarding contextuality is, is a great thing in our country, and so it's, very, it's, it's worth to, to follow them. And another solution, you can join Upfire, we can work together. We have around 100 contexts in our system, it is very huge and uh, you can, we, can, we can practice them there, so uh, appropriate link uh, here. So, okay, that's it for today. Thank you very much for your attention, and if you have any questions, we can talk here or during the after party.